Hello, welcome to this second module of the Mining Engineering MOOC devoted to mining geomechanics. My name is Olivier Buzy, I'm an associate professor at the University of Newcastle and my research falls in the area of rock mechanics, in particular rock joints and uh, rockfall. Today we're going to introduce in this topic uh, the two key variables required to define fundamental behaviour of materials. These variables are stress and strain. In many engineering applications, it is required to assess how a structure deforms uh, or behaves under a load. Um, making such an assessment requires some knowledge about the material constituting the structure itself. For example, you couldn't sit on a chair made of rubber. You need a stronger material like hard plastic or timber. So when it comes to characterizing a material, there are two questions we need to answer. One is how much does a material deform under a load? Second question is how much load does it take for that material to break? And to answer these questions, we need to define stress and strains. Let's see why with an experiment. We take a short rubber band and we're going to place this rubber band in tension. We start by measuring its initial length, which comes to 54 millimeters. And we place a weight on this hanger to stretch the rubber band. It now stretches to 62 millimeters. Let's write these results on the board. So we have a short rubber band. We have an initial length of 54 millimeters, a final length of 62 millimeters. That gives us an, an elongation that I will call delta L of 8 millimeters. Now let's repeat the experiment with a longer rubber band. So again we place the uh, hanger on the band and measure the initial length. This comes at 102 millimeters. We place the weight on the hanger there and stretch the rubber band and measure the final length again. And it comes at about 117 millimeters. Let's write the results on the board. So we have a long rubber band. The initial length is 102 millimeters and the final length is 117 millimeters. That gives us an elongation delta L of 15 millimeters. What that shows is if you use the elongation or change in length to characterize the material's behavior, you don't have the same number. However, it is the same material, it's the same rubber, the material has the same width, the same thickness, but we have different initial lengths and we have different elongations. So we can't use elongation to characterize the material's behavior. However, Let's see what proportion of the initial length L0 this delta L represents. If we divide the change in length by the initial length, for the short rubber band we get 8 millimeters over 54 and that's about 0.15 or 15%. For the long rubber band we have delta L over L0 equal 15 over 102 and that's about 0.15 or 15%. We now see that the numbers do match. We have now characterized the material's behavior, its capacity to stretch under a load, regardless of the geometry of the specimen we've tested, in this case, in the initial length. This parameter, delta L over L note, is noted epsilon, usually in mechanics, and this is a strain. Epsilon is a length over a length and hence has no unit. Now let's perform another experiment regarding stresses. In this experiment, we're going to pull on two polystyrene specimens of different uh, cross sections, and we're going to uh, bring them to failure. What we're going to use for this experiment as well is a dynamometer, which is um, graduated in newtons. And that will give us an indication of the load it took to actually break the specimens. So let's start with this the specimen having the uh, smallest cross section. So I will, there is a system inside the dynamometer that records uh, the maximum load we reached. I'll now pull on it and break it. Here we go. 
Let's see now what load it took to reach failure. It's about 42 newtons, as you can see there. Let's try the results on the board. So we have the small specimen. And the force to failure is 42 newtons. Now, let's repeat the experiment with a larger specimen. We use the dynamometer again. And similarly, I'll pull until we've reached failure. Here we go. We now have reached about 85 newtons. Let's try the result on the board. Once again, we see that the numbers don't match. If we use the force as an indication of half of resistance of the material, we cannot basically tell how strong the polystyrene is without considering the cross-section of the specimen. To some extent, these results aren't surprising because we have different cross-section. There is more material to break on this specimen than on this one. So it's not a surprise to have a larger number here. Because it's actually all this material that contributes to the resistance, Let's do a simple calculation and divide this force by the cross-sectional area of the specimen. For the small specimen, F over A is 42 newtons divided by 0.01, which is 10 millimeter thickness, times 0.015, which is 15 millimeters across. And that gives us about 280,000 newton per meter square. These numbers are expressed in meters. Now let's do the same calculation for the large specimen. We now have F over A equal to 85 divided by 0.01, which is again the thickness of the specimen, times 0.03, which is the width of the specimen. And that gives us about 280,000 newton per square meters. So we now see that the two numbers do match. We've managed to quantify the resistance of the polystyrene regardless of the uh, geometry of the specimen, in this case, the cross-sectional area. So for a one-dimensional tensile test, the force divided by the cross-sectional area, area, F over A, is called the stress, noted sigma. And a stress, as you've seen here, as a unit of Newton over an area, meter square, or also called Pascal and noted PA. Stress and strain are critical in engineering because they help quantifying a material's behavior regardless of the geometry of the specimen tested. So initial length, for example, diameter or cross-sectional area. In these experiments, we've used only simple one-dimensional testing, elongation or breakage. But in engineering, in many cases, the stress distribution is far more complex and it's often a 3D situation. Uh, in that case, defining the stress and strain is far more complex than we've done here, but this is not covered in this course. I invite you to refer to the uh, additional resources if you want more information on this topic.